Hi, my name is Carl Hoppe. I'm the Extension Livestock Specialist at the Carrington Research Extension Center. And today I'm going to visit about feed rations for backgrounding cattle, and this is the fall 2020. This is brought to you by NDSU Extension. Well, new calf crops are here, 2020. Uh, time to place them on feed and look at what type of calves we have. You know, these January born calves are going to be big. These April and June born calves are going to be smaller. So we got a little bit of everything out there in the pen. We have different colors. We have different types, sexes, uh, bulls, steers, heifer. Hopefully most of them are castrated if they're going to the commercial market. And uh, there's just a lot of differences out there. But it's a new year and a new season, a new group of calves that need to be placed on feed. A couple comments here. Traditionally in backgrounding calves, we grow cattle and uh, it takes feed. Um, in the Northern Plains, we're a backgrounding state. If we're in the Southern Plains, we would still have grass or some type of feed resources out there in which to graze. So in the Northern Plains, it ends up being a feeding state. So that's kind of the difference between backgrounding and stalker cattle. Backgrounding means we're feeding them for a period of time after weaning. Now the feed prices follow the corn price. That's traditionally what's been going on and it continues to go on that way. So as corn prices are increased, so does the overall prices of other feedstuffs increase as well. Let's go through some examples. Let's take a walk back in memory lane. I like, to, I like to reflect on these just to have an idea of what prices were just a few years ago because, you know, we tend to even remember, we only remember about a year back, so not even that far at time what happened. But in 2017, our corn price is 288 a bushel. And our distillers grains was a dollar, I was $113 a ton. Hays were anywhere from $65 to $85 a ton, depending upon what it was, and wheat mitzes were at $95. And at that time, we still had barley malt sprouts in the region in which to feed. In 2018, the price of corn went up to three bucks a bushel. Hay remained about the same. Price of distillers grains went up slightly, as well as wheat mids and barley malt sprouts were not available in North, made in North Dakota at least. Now for 2019, just last year, the price of corn did go up another 10%. Hayes remained about the same price. Wheat mids were a little bit lower. And, and uh, distillers grains reflected the corn price and it increased as well. Now let's see what's happened for 2020. Corn prices increased slightly. Hay and uh, both alfalfa and grass hay, at least this is alfalfa hay for steers, uh, for beef cattle, not necessarily for dairy cattle. Um, have remained the same compared to previous years. Wheat mids has creeped up just a little bit. Distillers grains has increased quite a bit. There's been a demand for distillers grains and the price is up. Canola mill prices are up as well. And the price of corn silage, because the price of corn has increased, the price of corn silage has increased as well. Must make note, we have a lot of processing plants in North Dakota. Some states don't have this opportunity that we have. But if you're located in the right location, and you need some supplemental feeds, the price of these feeds along with your freight might make it very competitive to bring that into your feed yard. If you're in western North Dakota, you've got a lot of freight compared to being located in eastern North Dakota. Uh, distillers grains is quite prevalent throughout the, the lower part of, the, of North Dakota and even into South Dakota. So uh, the amount of co-product feeds made from distillers grains is, is quite readily available as well as wheat mids. And we have uh, oil crushes throughout North Dakota that would make um, soybean meal, canola meal, sunflower meal, uh, those types of things where the oil has been taken out. We do have sugar processing plants in the state, uh, sugar beets that is, and they produce beet pulp. We used to have tailings, but most of those might be going through the new ethanol plant that's producing up in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Here's just a rundown of the co-product feeds in North Dakota rather than a map. As I said, we got five different distillage grain plants, uh, five different ethanol plants that produce distillage grains uh, in North Dakota and actually several more throughout the region. They produce both wet, which would be like 60% moisture, modified, which is 50% moisture, and dried, which is basically a dried 95% dry matter feed. Sometimes they produce what's called corn syrup, but 
Its real name is condensed distillery solubles. Uh, most of these plants put this back onto the distillage grains. That's why it's called distillers, distillage grains with solubles. Um, although most of the time we just shorten it up and say DDGs, which is dry distillage grains, or just distillage grains if we're talking about the wetter modified. And for those people that do get distillers grains with solubles, excuse me, condensed distillery solubles, they just call it corn syrup. Not to be confused with the corn syrup that comes out of a fructose refining plant, a, corn, a wet corn milling plant, like there is down in Wapiton, North Dakota. Uh, but that usually goes to the human food industry and not to our livestock feed. So usually when we're talking corn syrup and livestock, it's always distillers grains. We do have wheat middlings in North Dakota. The North Dakota Mill and Elevator is the largest mill in the world in one location. And of course, we, the, the taxpayers of North Dakota, own the state mill and elevator in Grand Forks, and they're very competitively priced when it comes to wheat mints. Of course, we have a mill up in Minot, Carrington, and Fairmont, and even some milling is done up in Candu. Barley malt sprouts is only done in, is it done out of state now in, in Moorhead. Uh, we don't uh, have a mill a sprouting plant. Well, it's closed now, has been for several years in North Dakota. We do have a corn gluten feed plant or a fructose plant, wet corn milling plant that produces corn gluten feed as well as corn gluten meal. Meal is about 60% protein, usually goes into a lot of our dog food type diets, pet diets, um, not so much into our animal diets, but corn gluten feeds widely utilized in the dairy industry and can be in the beef industry too. Uh, the plant now produces only wet product. That's how much the demand there is that we even produce the dry. We do have a couple of potato processing plants in North Dakota, one in Grand Forks, one in Jamestown. If you're on the list to get it year round, you are probably their favorite customer. It's really hard to get this product in the off season, but it is available uh, depending upon what the supply is. Beet tailings, um, again, that used to be readily available, but now with the ethanol plant located up in Grand Forks that utilizes uh, potato waste as well as tailings, um, beet tailings, uh, they, they might be more uh, difficult to get a hold of. Beet pulp is still available uh, when the dryers can't catch up or meet the demand of drying down beet pulp. Of course, our mills, canola mill, linseed mill, which is from flax, sunflower mill, and soybean mill are uh, produced at several plants across North Dakota. One, a couple of these plants are swing plants where they produce other, it depends upon the time of the year that they're crushing what particular items. Right now, we don't have a mill in North Dakota that is crushing soybeans. Um, so consequently, there would be no soy hulls available in North Dakota. But if you go across the border into South Dakota, there is plenty of mill and hulls available in Aberdeen. Of course, there's always screenings that are produced everywhere, but be sure to watch out for weed seeds that might be in screenings. Uh, the favorite one now is Palmer amaranth or, or Palmer pigweed. And if those seeds are in some screenings that are brought in from out of state, you have just created a, a uh, very weed uh, herbicide resistant plant into your fields or your feedlot. And just be careful about what you're buying when you're buying screenings. If they're locally from North Dakota and sourced locally from North Dakota, that problem shouldn't be there with noxious weeds that can't be controlled with herbicides. Let's talk a little bit about cattle now. Um, there is a daily nutrient need for certain feed ingredients for cattle. I'm going to try to lay out here that our most expensive costs for feeding cattle is in feeding what we call energy. That'd be the starch and the fiber that the animals digest and utilize to make their bodies grow. A lot of times we talk about proteins, but in reality, it's the energy that costs the most. And we do buy protein supplements to meet the needs, but usually energy is the biggest expense. So let's just use some assumptions. We have a 700 pound steer. He's eating 3% of body weight. And uh, that would calculate almost 18 pounds of dry matter feed. And if we look in the energy world, we can utilize two different terms to describe the amount of energy the animal needs. It's either in megacals of net energy for gain or simply placed as TDN, which refers to as total digestible nutrients. Well, for easy math, we can use the 14.12 pounds of TDN needed by the animal. And in order to get that, the cost of energy, when you look at the price of corn, 
and just do the calculations for the cost per pound of TDM, it comes up, up to be five cents per bushel. So this example, 14 times five gets 70 cents a day for the, for the energy cost to feed an animal, a 700 pound steer. Now they need 13.1% crude protein in their diet. And if they're eating 18 pounds of feed, that roughly means 2.33 pounds of crude protein is needed per day. Crude protein, if you look at the soybean meals or the other meals, um, it's uh, 18 cents a pound in this example, which means it costs almost 42 cents a day just in protein costs. So just in that calculation alone, we spend more money in energy than we do in protein. But think of this, when we buy corn, uh, we buy 80, almost 90% of the corn is energy, but 8% of that corn or nine, or maybe even 10% of that corn is going to be protein. So if we need 13% protein in the ration, and we bought corn and hay that averages 10% protein, we only need to add an extra um, six tenths of a pound of crude protein a day. So my math down there is 2.33 minus 1.74 pounds. That's the amount of protein that is in the feed uh, that we bought for the energy. So we need to provide an additional six tenths of a pound of protein to the cattle. At 18 cents a pound, that means we spent a penny, excuse me, a dime. So energy cost in this ration would be 70 cents. The additional protein cost this ration is 10 cents. And for those of you that wonder about the cost of water, rural water would cost maybe two cents, depending upon what your rates are in your location and the cost and the amount of water they, they drink. But I like to point that out, that water is actually a very cheap part of our ration. But energy is most expensive. And protein, while we usually talk about protein a lot, and we do need protein to aid in digestion, it's really only a small percentage of the total amount of feed that we provide to their animals on a daily basis. Let's calculate some numbers for feed value. In other words, cost per pound of nutrient. The two big nutrients here are gonna be crude protein and TDM. Let's take the first example, canola meal. Uh, it's 90% dry matter. Let's use the math on an as-fed basis and the crude protein of canola meal on an as-fed basis is 38.7%. The cost per ton as-fed would be $255 a ton. The cost per pound then is a dollar is 12.7 cents. You take the 0.127, divide that by 0.387, that's the 38.7% crude protein, and we end up with a 29 cent cost per pound of protein. That's how we calculate cost per pound of protein coming out of the feedstock. Now we do the same thing in calculating cost per pound of TDM, except we use that 1.27 and divide it by 0.621. That's the TDN energy of, the, of canola mill. And that ends up with 0.84. We do the same math for wheat mints, corn grain, and distillers. And as you look through there, what's the cheapest cost of protein of a TDN? We normally think corn grain is the cheapest cost of TDN, and that's exactly what our math turns out to be. It's fairly cheap and it's, it's a fairly low cost feed. Wheat mints is right behind it, uh, fairly close, and distillers grains are somewhat competitive. Now, if you look at canola meal, that is definitely not an energy source that we'd use in our rations because of the high cost for energy. Now, look, let's look at the cost per pound of protein. Where's our cheapest cost per pound of protein? It's actually in the distillage grains. And then wheat mitts, and then canola meal. No, actually, our cheapest sauce is distillage grains, then canola meal, then wheat mitts. And of course, corn grain would have a very high cost per pound of protein because it's not utilized for protein as a protein supplement, it's utilized as an energy supplement. So if we need energy, we look towards corn. If we need protein, we usually look at protein supplements like canola meal. However, distiller's grains can almost be considered one of those that's both a protein supplement as well as an energy source. And quite frankly, wheat mids falls in that same category too. So when you start looking at rations, please keep these in mind as two co-product feed sources that can help balance a ration. Before I get into rations, I'd like to talk about some feed issues in North Dakota, 2020. This year, corn silage um, it wasn't as difficult for harvest as it was in previous years, but we did, like last year, but we did end up with an early frost the first part of September 
Um, we've been kind of used to having a frost that doesn't show up until the first part of October. So we lost about a month worth of growth. And of course, when it freezes, um, corn choppers are, they want to have every, everybody's asking for them to show up their place now because corn is ready at that particular time. So the amount of delay you have from the time it froze to the time it actually gets chopped um, affects the moisture content of the feed. And that in turn can affect the feed value. So I always encourage you to feed test. Dryer silages, like this picture where the corn was froze, and you can see that kind of a light green color in the corn. Um, it dries out and there will be some poor fermentation due to X and, and that'll lead to excess heating. So I like this temperature gauge. It's a three foot long gauge that you stick into the silage pile and it tells you what the temperature is. Just a few weeks after chopping, it was only at 82 degrees. About a month and a half later, it went up to 100 degrees, which indicates there's more, um, more air or fermentation going into the, into the pile because of uh, the lower moisture content. One other issue that we've had I've ran into this year is, is dry edible beans. It appears there's enough moldy and discolored beans that producers of dry beans can't sell them or market them. Um, so consequently, they've offered these to beef cattle producers say, can you use those? And in reality, we can. Unfortunately, we can't use a lot. Some of the research projects have shown that if you feed at a high degree, you can actually, like 20, 30 percent, even more of the diet, the cattle will just stop eating. So the recommendation comes down to limit to 10 percent of the ration. You might be able to go up to 20 percent, but watch cattle performance. And if they don't decrease in performance, continue on. Here's the things you'll see uh, with cattle. There'll be digestion issues, um, probably some scours. Decrease feed intake and actually downright feed refusal. Remember one project using great northern bean, northern great white, northern great northern whites, and uh, the cattle actually had I think 30 or 40 percent of the ration just stopped eating the ration and wouldn't eat. They actually had to discontinue feeding that because um, you know animal health they'd die if they won't eat. So cattle might eat it for a little bit. Be careful how much you can put in. I suspect if you wanted to cook these, you could probably eat more. But um, cooking beans before feeding the cattle probably isn't a realistic thing for us in the Northern Great Plains. Here's some rations for feeding cattle. And for the next four slides, we're gonna have uh, different rations for 700 pound steers and different rates of gain and correspondingly different feed costs. The first one is simply 13 pounds of grass hay. And we need some protein and energy to add to it in order to get enough gain because grass hay itself won't provide a two pound a day gain. But 13 pounds of grass hay and then seven pounds of wheat mids will give us a two pound a day gain. The rations around the 64% TDN, the cost to feed um, per pound of gain is 42 cents. If you look at a little bit better gain, we have to change our ration around. We gotta increase some alfalfa hay actually pick up some wheat mids. Why do we increase alfalfa hay? Because alfalfa hay has got calcium in it, while wheat mids is really high in phosphorus. And without the adequate two to one or one to one ratio of, of calcium to phosphorus, you can end up with urinary calculi in cattle. You don't want kidney stones in cattle, so you need to balance the ration for calcium phosphorus as well. This is a real deal. Most of the time we don't have a problem with it, but it certainly can if the rations are improperly balanced. Okay, so this particular ration will give you 2.6 pounds per day gain and 37 cent cost of gain. Please note that as our gain increases, our cost of grain decreases. Now let's just use a ration that's got, we go from 2.6 to 2.8, that's not much, is it? That's just a, just a few more pounds. In this ration, we used eight pounds of hay, grass hay, 12 pounds of wheat mids, and we had to include limestone in an ounce per head per day, just because of the extra calcium needed in this ration because wheat mids are high in phosphorus. We need to add extra calcium. So a 2.8 pound a day gain, uh, feed cost is 35 cents per pound a gain. Again, as we pick up the rate of gain, our cost of feed, our cost per pound of gain tends to go less. Now here's another set of rations. Say we put up a lot of corn silage, we had alfalfa hay. So alfalfa hay is the queen of forages 
corn silage is the king of forages. In this example, eight pounds of alfalfa hay, 29 pounds of corn silage. You might think that's a lot of feed, but that's 29 pounds of wet feed, which would be what's one third to 29, maybe 10 pounds of dry feed. So they gain 1.8 pounds on this particular ration and feed cost is 0.48. That's $35 a ton corn silage and $90 a ton alfalfa hay. Now let's cheapen this up with some grass hay and corn grain and wheat mitts. And in this particular example, we've got 2.6 pounds per day gain, feeding six pounds of hay, four pounds of alfalfa hay, two pounds of corn grain, and eight pounds of wheat middlings. And our feed cost per pound of gain is 38 cents. Again, as we increase the gain, the cost of the gain goes down. And if we tweak this ration a little bit more, so we're giving them even more corn grain and uh, less out, they're only going to eat so much. So we have, to, if we give them more corn grain, we're going to have to back something out of the ration. So we give them less grass hay and a little less wheat mitts. And now we got three pound a day gain, and our feed cost per pound again is 3.6. So again, the same true message rings true. Uh, that as we increase the gain, the cost of the gain goes down. Uh, please note that corn size always get this comment. Wow, I'm feeding a hell out of pounds out there. Can they eat that much? And the answer is yes, because it is mostly water. They're not going to be drinking as much water because they ate it in their feed. Okay. Now here's another ration of simple alfalfa hay and corn grain. Um, no wet feed here. We can feed an all dry ration. This particular one would be 2.3 pounds a day gain, and our feed cost is 46 cents. At two point, let's uh, go backwards a slide for a second. Uh, maybe I can't. Uh, now we got another ration that's alfalfa hay at seven pounds, corn grain 11.5, and then because we're not feeding enough alfalfa hay and quite a bit of corn grain. We need to add a provide an, a protein supplement, and it's going to have uh, extra calcium in it as well. So it's going to be 1.5 pounds of that particular feed, and then we're going to get a 3.1 pound a day gain, and it's going to cost us 46 cents per pound a gain. If we tweak this ration a little bit more and decrease the alfalfa hay and increase the corn grain a couple pounds, uh, we'll get a little bit better gain at 3.4, and our feed costs are now down to 42 cents. Well, now let's do another ration using grass hay and distillers grains. 15 grass hay, five pounds of distillers. Feed cost is going to be almost five, 50 cents per pound of gain. If you look at grass hay, corn grain, and distillers, we're at 38 cents. And if we look at grass hay, corn grain, distillers, and limestone, because we're feeding quite a bit of distillers and quite a bit of grain, and, and we're not getting calcium anywhere else, but it's got to come from limestone. All of a sudden, we're at 35 cents. We've got quite a spread going on here at cost of gains. Anywhere from 50 cents down to 35 cents. And when you're doing your budgets, uh, this certainly comes into a consideration of what type of profit you'll make. Because if you're paying for feed and not getting gain, you need to be careful of how you're doing things. Now, we should talk about rates of gain in cattle. Low rates of gain are considered less than two pounds a day gain. That works quite well for cattle that are going to be heading for grass cattle. It also works quite well for replacement heifers. Um, we don't need to have a replacement heifer weigh 1,300 pounds when she goes out on grass. She's probably going to go backwards and lose weight if that's the case. But if you have her at 1.8 pounds a day gain throughout the whole winter and going up the breeding season, she'll be in good condition, weigh the appropriate rate, um, roughly Heifers should weigh 80% of mature weight at their first calving and 80% of their first calving weight at breeding. So um, we're looking at an eight to nine weight steer, uh, excuse me, heifer, uh, when it gets to be breeding time. And a lot of times if you do the back math here, 100, 150, 180 days on feed at a pound and a half a day will give us uh, enough weight on these heifers to make them into breeding season without spending too much money on uh, feed and getting them too fleshy because we are inventorying them until they're breedable and ready to go out to grass. Um, if you're looking to grow cattle without adding too much condition, and condition is referred to as fat, um, two to three pound average daily gain is where we look at. Um, three pounds a day for 60 days as compared to um, Two pounds a day for 100 days. Uh, different ways to grow cattle. Remember, if you feed them really heavy, um, 
you might end up with fleshy cattle, which leads us to the next life rate, which would be greater than three pounds per day average daily gain. That's almost what we call a finishing ration, and it really would be. We can feed it to young calves that have just been weaned. They're just going to get fat at an earlier age, and if you're looking to get them harvested less than a year of age, this might be the way to do it. However, feedlots, feedlots like to buy cattle that have not been fed at these higher rates of gain because it might reduce subsequent feedlot performance. However, some cattle are genetically disposed to gain well even without any loss of performance and can grow and grade extremely well um, even if they're fed at higher rates of gain. So if you know what type of animals you have, you might be able to get this by, get by with this, and it works quite well especially if you're looking to get animals and you can feed them on your own farm until finish. This is something that we do routinely on calves that are brought in weighing five, 600 pounds and trying to be sold at, at 11 to 12 months of age, which can be done, it just needs to be pushed. You need to look at the historical performance of the cattle, what type of cattle they are. That'll give you insight of how you wanna manage these. Of course, the next piece of the puzzle is, what is the market price going to be at the time that you're looking to sell these cattle? And uh, usually most of our springborn calves get fed to be dead come the summer of the next year. And that's usually when the market low is. So we try to background cattle or feed cattle to avoid marketing them into that particular time frame. Otherwise, we end up uh, getting a lower price. So we can target calf gain with a balanced ration. Um, I always think of a balanced ration where we have adequate amounts of energy and protein to give us our better gains in feed efficiency. But when we're looking at a target weight, I think about that as being the ideal issue of backgrounding. So we wean calves, we wanna feed them for two months so we can get them sold after the first year. We might have three pounds average daily gainers our goal, goal, and that'd be 180 pounds on these calves. Or we might be looking at selling these calves six months from now into the grass cattle market. That would be come April and people would be looking for those calves. And there's usually quite a price for green type calves and green, I mean, under flesh calves that time of the year. And uh, 1.5 average, average daily gain for 120 days is gonna be 180 pounds. So in these two scenarios, we feed for 180 pounds, but we certainly change the market window by quite a bit. And of course, different market windows can lead to different prices. You can source core product feeds in different locations. Uh, there is an info sheet on this website that uh, shows where there is selected prices of co-products that are produced in North Dakota with phone numbers and a spot market price available there. Um, let me just note that we can contract feed prices to cattle and they're usually uh, low during the summer times. And if you can put in, if you can estimate what your need is for the fall time, uh, you can probably get into a contract at that lower price rather than waiting for the spot price. And it usually gets higher after the first year whenever people start feeding. Big issue is when it comes to feeding co-products is how far the freight, how far you are away from the plant, or in other words, how much freight there is. Some people haul a wet product hundreds of miles and I always have to do the math and wonder why they are doing that. There must be other reasons other than cost of feed. Maybe they're looking for a wet product. Maybe they've got a trucker or somebody they're trying to keep in business. The, the real issue though is we can't afford to haul wet feed too far because of the high price of, of uh, trucking. After a while, it gets to be cheaper to haul dry product if we're hauling it. It's even cheaper if we raise it on our own farm and uh, produce it that way. Usually for background in cattle, we look for high fiber feeds, and a lot of these co-products are high in protein as well. A lot of our hays are usually a little bit lower in protein, so by adding in a co-product, it mixes well with our hays to increase the protein sources. Please uh, think about good feed bunk management, good feeding management for your calves. This is the opportunity for you to train them on how to develop their behavior of eating out of a feed bunk, when to eat, develop their routine and that'll stay with them. So far, mother has been doing, the mother cow has been doing that to the calf. They graze in the morning and graze at night. Now it's your opportunity to train these cattle on how they are going to be fed. We don't wanna just keep the feed bunks full. That means they can eat whenever they want to, which we do want is to have the feed bunks filled 
to what the animal's intake will be for the day, and then we put in new feed for what their intake will be the following day. Try to have the bunks cleaned up. Um, we usually practice what I call a slick bunk philosophy. That's where when you come out to feed in the morning, their bunks should be all slicked up. Cattle have eaten everything they need, and now they're ready to eat more. And please practice that. Uh, one of the big issues we run into is when you have variable intake, they eat a bunch today, not so hungry tomorrow, and then they eat a bunch on the second, third day, not so hungry, they eat a bunch more on the fifth day. In doing so, it creates kind of a yo-yo effect, and the animal's steady state condition and room and fermentation goes haywire, and the cattle are not as efficient in digesting that food as compared to having a meal every day at the same time. Don't forget betting. We've done research at the Carrington Research Extension Center that shows where betting can improve average daily gain in these calves. And, uh, and, and it's not because they're eating the bedding, it's because uh, it's a nicer environment for them to lay on. Water should be kept clean, so cattle will be readily willing to drink it. Um, try to reduce the amount of mold you feed the cattle. And if you do feed it, you'll notice there will be digestive upsets, especially in these young calves that are just developing onto a new ration. You can keep cattle healthy, whether it means antibiotics in the feed with a veterinary feed directive, or working them through a shoot and giving antibiotics if they're snotty, or just pre-vaccinations. There's a lot of things you can do to keep cattle healthy, and when healthy cattle are healthy, they consume lots of feed and grow very well. Adapt a ration slowly. In other words, um, we start with a step-up ration, one that's higher in forage and lower in energy content. And as the cattle are filled up, we, after three or four days or, or a week or two weeks, we bump them up to a higher energy ration, a step up ration that would have a little bit more grain in it. And then we might do that two or three times, depending upon what our goal for rates of gains are. Um, we just don't dump a whole bunch of grain out there and hope they don't get acidosis and die on you. That certainly is something that can happen. So that's why balanced rations and step up rations are certainly utilized by nutritionists and it works quite well. The old thumb roll way of feeding is you give them a couple pounds of grain along with all the hay they want to eat, and then in two days we give them a couple pounds of grain and another half a pound of grain, and do that plus a full feed of hay. We do that for a few days, and when they're adapted to that ration, then we increase it again by another half a pound for two days and keep moving up the grain part of the ration until the cattle have matched your target goal ration that you're using for whatever gain it is we're looking for. Again, balance the ration. There's lots of feed nutritionists, whether it be uh, your county extension agent or a feed company uh, that provides this service. Um, there's lots of ways to put together rations for cattle. And let's not forget there are other things that can improve feed efficiencies in cattle. Ionophores, Remensen, or Bovitec can improve feed efficiency by five to seven percent. Implants, the ear implants can increase average daily gain because there are steroid that will and they can increase it by five to seven percent and your feed per pound of gain can be improved by five to twelve percent these things can also control coccidiosis um, if you ever run into coccidiosis outbreak in a group of cattle you'll wish that never happened and you will do anything in the future to prevent that from happening and use the onophores or dequinate or corid our options to our feed things that we can add to the feed to prevent coccidiosis. Of course, coccidiosis is usually an opportunistic type thing that always develops after a stress. So if you have a blizzard, that would be a stress. Cold weather can be a stress. Commingling cattle together is new stress. Just being weaned can be a stress. So pack all these stresses on top of each other and coccidiosis might break out, especially if you make a diet change or a ration change that's higher in energy. That can lead to an additional stress. So only one stress at a time. Don't stack them up and make them endure and then you end up with a health issue. Well, in summary here, let me just say that it looks like feed prices are higher this year. As true this year as in other years, higher average daily gains usually have a lower cost per pound of gain. We have lots of options out here in developing rations. We tend to always use distillers grains in our rations because of where it's priced and the availability, and it is quite available, quite available. But there are other feeds that are available out here too, and we can use those if that's what you need. Co-products are usually higher in protein and fiber, 
and actually work into a backgrounding ration very well. In a finishing ration, maybe not so much because they just don't have the overall energy density to be included at a high rate in the, in the ration, but certainly a smaller percentage could work. And again, your management in feeding goes a long way to good calf gains. If they're used to being fed at eight o'clock in the morning, keep them fed every morning at eight o'clock, making different changes, going a little bit earlier, going a little bit later, all leads to behavioral changes in cattle that can lead to poorer gains.